So these are some of the approaches to church reproduction. Let's move on now to regional strategies. Now this is going to include church reproduction. But what we're talking about here is looking at a whole city, looking at a whole state, uh, a county, and saying, how can we not just plant a church here and there, but how can we strategically look at a whole region to saturate that region with the gospel and plant multiple churches and really launch a movement? So let's talk about a couple of different approaches. Now, one is simply sort of what has been called harvest priority. And what this simply means is you evangelize in this town and see if anybody responds. You evangelize in this town and see if anybody responds. And then you find that place where the people seem most receptive to the gospel, where people have received Christ or are open, they want to hear more, and you say, okay, I am going to go to that place where the people seem the most open. And that makes sense because you could spend a lot of time in a place where the people are not open, while meanwhile these people here would gladly receive the message. And we might think of Jesus where he said, you know, to the disciples, when you go around from village to village, if somebody rejects you, knock the dust off your feet and move on. And at that place where you're received, stay there. And so one of the ideas is say, look for what's been called the man of peace or a person of peace. So when you go to that town or that part of the city, um, is there somebody there who welcomes you in, who can, uh, who can open doors and relationships in that community for you? Especially if you're coming in as an outsider, uh, you need people who can introduce you to others, people who can give you some credibility. Um, and so that's one of the ways that said, well, all things being equal, let's focus on those parts of the city or those towns and villages where people are receptive to the gospel. Uh, one of the problems with that is you may be using an evangelistic method that is just not appropriate. Maybe you're doing campaign evangelism where you, you put on a big uh, uh, evangelistic event of some kind, but people just don't come. But if you were to use another approach, maybe just using uh, evangelistic Bible study or uh, Bible storying approaches, maybe then the people would be open and you could reach them. So we have to be thinking that we're using appropriate evangelistic methods before we too quickly make a judgment that people are not open. And then, of course, especially in very resistant parts of the world where it seems like nobody's very open to the gospel, uh, we'll have to make other decisions. Then there's what uh, can be called the strategic beachhead approach. And that is where you say, well, we're going to establish a beachhead, you know, in a military uh, campaign. You, you try and get a foothold. And so the the landing craft come in and they try and get a foothold on the mainland so where from that point out they can begin to reach into the, the inland. And so uh, the idea with the strategic beachhead is you say, well, let's plant a strong church in every major city of the country. Um, and uh, then each one of those churches will then be responsible to evangelize in the region around it. Um, this was uh, one of the things that uh, the German Free Church attempted to do in the 1990s as uh, the uh, Iron Curtain came down and as the opportunity to evangelize in eastern Germany. Uh, these are the states of eastern Germany. And they said, well, let's look at each major city. There were already about 20 churches that they had in eastern Germany. Uh, many of them were rural churches. And so they said, let's target each of the major uh, cities in this uh, uh, part of our country now, you reunified Germany, and in these major cities, we will try and plant uh, a church. And uh, each of these cities might have been maybe an hour to two hour drive distant from one another. Well, uh, that seems to be in keeping with what the Apostle Paul did. He would plant a church in Thessalonica and move on. He wouldn't go to the very next town. He'd move a little further down um, and then expect those churches to reach their region. One of the weaknesses of this approach is that uh, these churches can end up sort of feeling alone because there's no other church in their fellowship that's nearby. And so... Um, Others have suggested what would be called cluster church planting, sort of like a cluster of grapes. 
instead of having a church here and a church there all distant, why not cluster churches in a geographical area? They're not so far apart. So you concentrate your, your energies more on a geographical area that's closer in proximity. And the advantage to that is you can get sort of a synergy effect. These churches are closer to each other and they can help each other out and they can uh, have training together. So instead of doing training here, training there, bring the people together and do training together. If you're having evangelistic campaigns, you can help each other. Even advertising in a large urban area, you can advertise together and have different locations of churches. And so the idea of clustered church planting um, can actually get more of a momentum, a sense of movement, because it's just not an isolated church. Let me give you an example of this in, uh, in the Munich area, and I give this example, it's a little dated, but it's the one I experienced firsthand because I was a part of it. Now, church planning by the Evangelical Free Churches in Greater Munich, uh, the first church was started as sort of a beachhead, as it were, in 1967, quite a while ago now. And they just began with meetings in literally in a, a rented space in the train station. And then they rented place in the German Museum. And then they eventually got a meeting place and developed a church ministry. It was a real pioneer church plant beachhead. But then it took them really a whole nother 10 years to establish a church in one of the more distant suburbs, as it were, uh, in the town of Fürstenfeldbruck. And the distance we're talking about here is uh, probably about uh, 25 kilometers maybe uh, from the center of the city, 30 kilometers maybe to that town. So this is what we're talking about. City of Munich itself has at this point maybe 2. Point million, uh, uh, excuse me, 1.2 million, and uh, the larger area maybe another uh, uh, half million or so. Well, that took them 10 years to get to their first real launching of another church in the region. It took another 10 years to launch another church down in the southern part of the city in uh, Otto Brun. And this was a case where the pastor of the mother church was preaching uh, in the early morning in that church, and then he'd get in the car and go and preach in the, in the central church later. It was a daughter church. They sent out a number of people to do that. But then what started happening, and this, the key here was the pastor in that central church that pastor had a vision. He was sort of a catalytic. Remember we were talking about catalytic church planters? He was a catalytic person who had a vision for planting multiple churches in the region. And he worked towards that. He taught his church how to get there. In fact, it was interesting. When I arrived in Munich in 1981, I met with a family down here in this town. And um, there was no church down there at this time. This is 1981. And I talked to this family and they were strong believers, I said, have you ever thought about planting a church here? I said, no, no, why, you know, why would we want to plant a church here? We've got, we've got the church in town and they've got all the programs and you know, we've heard, worked hard to get that and so why would we want to start another church here? They had no vision whatsoever. Well, as you can see, it's only a few years later, guess what? There's a church being planted in their town and you know who was one of the leading families? That very same family that said, no, why would we want to plant a church? The new pastor had cast vision. The new pastor had, had uh, helped people see the spiritual need. The new pastor gave them the confidence to move forward and to launch something they never thought that they would be a part of. So that's what it took to get that going. And then what started happening is things started moving more quickly. Two years later, a little further down on, on the Starnberg Lake, there were some contacts with believers and a retired pastor went down and helped launch that church. And so that started getting going. Then, uh, just two years later, we started the North Munich Church. And this is where I came in as the church planter in the North Munich Church. See, now within about a two year space, we're planning another church, we're planning another church. This church was a classic daughter church where they sent out about 30 adults from the mother church. And it was also right in the city. This was not in one of the far suburbs, like the other churches. We said for a city with 1.2 million, we need more churches in the city. The vision began to grow. And then in 1993, again, two years later, 
we had a multi-mother church. Remember, we were just talking about the multi-mother? Well, this is a case where First and Frau Book and the Central Munich Church together gave members and began to work to establish a church in Gammering. And this would be a suburb that had around 30,000 people that lived there. There was no evangelical church. And um, the, actually the pastor of the First and Felbrook Church uh, took responsibility, primary responsibility, and then they called a tent maker pastor. And so again, they're finding creative ways uh, to finance leadership in these churches, retired pastor, tent making pastor, foreign missionary, pastor from the mother church helping. They're finding creative ways to do this. Well, and then in 1995, again, two years later, this was the Dachau County Church, became Mark Dindersdorf, uh, where both the North Munich Church and the Central Church combined together for a multi-mother, again, uh, the, the uh, case I just explained to you. What you have was, uh, there were people, and this was probably closer to a 45-minute drive out from the city. And because the city was so expensive, Munich is very expensive, for families that had... Uh, three or more children, and uh, where both parents were not able to work, people couldn't afford to live in the city. And so we called them uh, our uh, economic refugees. They, they could not afford housing big enough for large families, so they moved way out into the suburbs. They could afford housing out there, and then they'd commute into work in the city with the train. And uh, actually, we had more children per adult in that church than any other church in the entire country in the denomination. A lot, of, a lot of families with four children, five children, and a children's ministry became a key ministry out there because it was not only our people, but other German people that worked in the city had the same situation. Large families moved out to the, to the country. And so, um, so anyway, uh, we started that church out there, uh, a multi-mother. Now we had a triple mother church that was started further in the east. Again, several members who lived out there and uh, Bible study started out there with members from these churches. And now we've got three mother churches helping to contribute. And um, so that was in 2001. 2006, that church then helped uh, an adoptive church. There was a, a little home group that was down in a, a smaller town out in the, the distant area there. They approached this church and said, will you help us start a church? They said, yes, they helped. Then in the city in 2007, in 2007, another church was started right in the city. They, uh, uh, this church struggled a little bit, but they went, they, rented, uh, they were renting space in a movie theater. This is something they're doing in Germany a lot these days. You go into a movie theater. Uh, Sunday mornings, most movie theaters, uh, cinemas are not showing movies. So <laughs> there's a nice auditorium there, and, and so churches were starting to do that. So they started another one, alternative, tr not even that geographically far from the original 1967 Mother Church. Uh, but seeking a very different kind of person. And then that church started again, another daughter church, recently in 2012, uh, in a little bit further south. So what you're seeing here is, again, sort of an accelerating dynamic, a synergy coming into place where churches are cooperating with one another, where members, when they move out further out, they become the seed for a new church, and there's a sense of movement. We would have common elder meetings where the elders from the different churches would come together. We do training together. We do biblical instruction for the young people together. We do a lot of things together better than we could do as individual small churches. Uh, we'd help each other out with evangelism. We'd help each other out with music. Um, and so there's a real sense of synergy. And what was most important is that there was a sense of the DNA of this movement. Each church that was planted knew they were expected to help plant another church. In other words, everybody didn't just keep looking back to the mother church saying, well, you start another church. But every church realized we need to be a part of this movement. We need to help start other churches also. And so that was one of the exciting things about that movement. And we're talking about a predominantly Roman Catholic area and uh, an area that is not especially uh, super open to the gospel. Um, and yet... Uh, we saw God work in this way. Not dramatic growth like you're seeing in some parts of the world, but uh, for this part of the world, it was significant. 
While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TVS Ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Well, there's many, many other examples. Uh, maybe even the example of Kursk here, where you had a mother church, you planted six daughter churches in, in this city of about a half a million people within a few years, uh, where the vision is there, the commitment is there, that creates a sense of movement. Um, another example was the so-called Encounter with God movement in Lima, and Encuentro con Dios. And um, this was a movement that was started with a lot of funding. And um, they started, uh, they well, there's actually a pre-existing church but then they launched a major campaign that lasted a month with a major follow-up. They built a building. It became a strong sort of catalytic church that launched daughter churches. And this diagram, you can sort of see uh, this was really launched in the 70s. And um, they would keep starting new churches. And here are some of the numbers by 1986. By 1997, uh, the numbers had grown more or less to, uh, to this sort of range. I don't have the more recent numbers, but it was a movement a lot of people were studying back then on um, uh, planning urban multiple church plants. And so this is what we call cluster church planning that creates a sense of movement, that creates a sense of commitment, an expectation, expectation. We can do this. God can do this. Um, if we will take the steps of faith. God will bless, and we can cooperate together and, and accomplish more. 